the devil should be the whole of the law. Love and law, love and your will. Thank you guys for coming. This is a subject that I find particularly interesting, and I think it is particularly important in that uh, it is in its very early stages, as far as I can tell, it's being a scientific approach to magic. And I think it's also important because of the immense potential that lies out there waiting for us to access it through this scientific method. If we've used science to achieve the kind of technology that we've achieved in the last century or so, imagine what it could do for our inner world. So there is an immense amount of uncharted territory. That's just kind of what I'd like to start with. So the, this is basically the spiritual pursuit, the same spiritual pursuit to know thyself, right? Scientific Illuminism, which is what I'll be talking about today, is a new approach, or new-ish, to that same voyage of knowing ourselves. Um, so I'm going to walk over here because I forgot to do this. Uh, this is a book that I'm going to very shamelessly promote that is called Naturalistic Occultism. I wrote the first edition of this nine years ago. This is the second edition, it's expanded, it's got this cool little thing on the front, um, looks science-y, come on, the lama, you get it? Uh, so I wrote that nine years ago, and frankly, I could not even have known the desire of a ton of occultists, both young and old, to have a scientific approach to magic. Uh, it seems like the modern occultist more often than not innately resonates with the idea of pursuing the aims of religion or the aims of spirituality with the, the methods of science. So the response was very overwhelmingly positive and encouraging. In fact, the most common thing I heard from people is that I just wrote it down first. You know, they've had, <laughs> they've had these ideas uh, and I just happened to write it down. Can you make money? Right. Uh, not very much, I might add. Uh, so, the, this book began as an essay that I actually wrote in undergraduate studies in psychology at UC Santa Cruz, represent slugs. Um, and the article or the, the essay that I wrote was about the neurobiology of out of body experiences. So, uh, what occultists might call astral projection. Uh, and my paper was that on the fact that there is actually a great deal of evidence that may point to a neurological model of the astral body and the astral plane. Uh, that forms, I believe, chapter 15 of this book now, and it just expanded around that idea. So, as I've learned more, my, my understanding increased a lot, but I found that what was written in the original edition didn't really need to be changed, just needed kind of expansion. So I added a few chapters, uh, and that is its current form. Uh, I want to emphasize that this material is an initiation in the most literal sense. They, the ideas expounded here represent a new beginning, which is what initiation means. It means to begin. So the field of scientific illuminism is only in its, basically its infant stage. Uh, the nurturing of this approach to maturity, I think, requires the insight and collaboration of many people approaching occultism and philema in this way. So, I, tonight I'm going to give a historical overview of scientific illuminism, which is a doctrine expounded by Aleister Crowley. Then I will talk about naturalistic occultism as kind of scientific illuminism 2.0. Uh, and then we'll engage in an ESP experiment, an extrasensory perception experiment. Uh, this is not meant to prove or disprove the existence of ESP. It is uh, more primarily meant to demonstrate the method of thinking about these kinds of things in a scientific way. Uh, and if we happen to prove ESP on our way, that's okay. Or disprove. Um, that looks good. So on the vernal equinox, the spring equinox of 1909, Crowley began releasing the equinox. Uh, we have this full 
first volume of the Equinox in that bookshelf in the top left takes up almost the whole bookshelf and is incredibly prolific. Uh, 19, this ran from 1909 to 1914, and a volume was released every six months. Um, the first one was, again, the Spring, Spring Equinox, March 21st, I believe, of 1909. Volume 1, number 1, of the Equinox. Now, the Equinox was the official organ of this new organization that Crowley created called the AA. The subtitle of the Equinox was the official organ of the AA, and the, uh, the review of scientific illuminism is what the Equinox was called. So if you look in the front of the book, it'll say the Equinox, the review of scientific illuminism, and it will show the motto, as you can see in this image, the method of science, the aim of religion, which um, I think is one of Crowley's great phrases, great ideas that he had just contained in that uh, very elegant phrase, the method of science, the aim of religion. Does anyone know why these characters might be on something called the Equinox? Aries and uh, Libra? Well done. For the equinoxes, ten, ten points right? awarded to Haley. Yes, <laughs> indeed, those are the Equinoxes. Some people seem to skip I wouldn't have gotten that if you hadn't asked that question. I know, most people don't even think I would actually sit there thinking, what's that ran for? <laughs> So uh, Crowley actually talks about this very thing. Welcome. Just find a seat wherever you're comfortable. Um, so Crowley talks about the fact that the, the publishing of volume one, number one of the Equinox, represented something bigger than just publishing a book. So he writes, in the year 1909, we find a drawing together of the paths by which Frater P, also known as Frater Perderabo, which is Crowley's motto, so Alistair Crowley, uh, in the year 1909, we find the drawing together of the paths by which Frater P. had been traveling. First, on March 21st, the conscious personal work of his life was crystallized in the thorough establishment of a system of scientific illuminism or skeptical theurgy through the publication of number one of the Equinox. The conscious personal work of his life was crystallized in the establishment of this system of scientific illuminism. Uh, so Crowley viewed this as a kind of momentous time in his life. He drew together all of his rational knowledge and created this new system that can be, again, summarized as the method of science, the aim of religion. Uh, so Crowley talks about scientific illuminism, and as you just saw, he calls it by different names. So he calls it skeptical theurgy, and in one place, he gets a little crazy and he calls it puro Zoroastrianism. And I want to make it very clear, these, these names are not three different systems. They are three terms for the same system. It is, uh, it, I don't want to do a kind of biblical exegesis on the equinox to show that this is true, but believe me, it is true. He uses these interchangeably to refer to this system. Could I ask what the yeah. puro... Yeah, I'll get to that in just okay. two seconds. So, these are not different ideologies, but different names for the same thing. Uh, in fact, you'll notice that they're all composed of two words, right? So, scientific to Crowley often meant skeptical, and Pyrrho is an ancient Greek known for his skepticism. It is a, a guy's name. Empiricism is the same group, right? Uh, I don't know about that, but I... That would be interesting. Whereas Illuminism is often equated to theurgy, which in this case is equated to Zoroastrianism. Okay? Now, to Crowley, Zoroaster was not just the proponent of Zoroastrianism, this kind of doctrine of Ahura Mazda and you know the dark side and that kind of thing. Uh, it referred to the author of the Oracles of Zoroaster. Which, is to, which we know as the Chaldean Oracles. Crowley knew it in its form translated by uh, W. Wynne Westcott, who was a, uh, an, a chief of the order, uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Okay? So this guy uh, translated this document full of these ancient kind of uh, aphorisms. It's really weird and crazy and uh, obscure if you find it, which you can online and in books. 
uh, Crowley was very interested in this, and he saw it as kind of these magical aphorisms to help engage in theurgy. Uh, to Crowley, theurgy often is equated with the mystical goal of attaining union with God, or the Absolute, or the One. Uh, so, he was probably just being cute by calling it pure Zoroastrianism. He's making these references to obscure things and being like, you get it, right? <laughs> and everyone's like, yeah, that's not exactly what Pyrrho was for, and that's not exactly Zoroastrianism, but sure. Um, so, if you open up the Equinox, which again is sitting over there, it's a very, it's ten volumes, it's gigantic. If you open up the very first one, at the very beginning, there's something called an editorial, and it explains <clears throat> the approach of scientific illuminism. Uh, again, the AA is an organization that Crowley founded to uh, bring forth this philosophy, so when it mentions the AA, it refers to that. Uh, I include it here, and I'll read it to you, to give you a sense of kind of the flavor of what he was going for. Okay. So the brothers of the AA announce themselves without miracle or mystery. It is easy for every charlatan to perform wonders, to bewilder and even to deceive not only fools but all persons, however shrewd, untrained in observation. Nor does the trained observer always succeed in instantly detecting the fraud. Again, what the AA proposed to do is to enable such men as capable of advancement to a higher interpretation of manhood to do so. Uh, Crowley often used man in its general sense of people. Just need to say that in 2016 in the Bay Area. Um, so what the AA proposed to do is to enable such men as are capable of advancement to a higher interpretation of manhood to do so. Basically evolve the species is the idea there. And the proof of their ability lies in their success, not in any other irrelevant phenomenon, which he's referring to miracles. As you can see, the argument from miracles is a non sequitur, which is to say the fact that you can produce miracles and these crazy experiences does not mean you are an involved human being. It's irrelevant. Nor is there anything mysterious in the AA itself. One must, must not confuse the mysterious with the unknown. Some of the contents of this review, meaning the Equinox, uh, may be difficult or impossible to understand at first, but only in the sense that Homer is unintelligible to a person ignorant of Greek. But the brothers of AA make no mystery. They give you not only the text, but the comment. Not only the comment, but the dictionary, the grammar, and the alphabet. He even means that in a very literal way. There's an actual dictionary an alphabet that he teaches in the AA. It is necessary to be thoroughly grounded in the language before you can appreciate its masterpieces. And if while totally ignorant of the former, you despise the latter, you will forgive the more frivolous onlookers if their amusement matches your indignation. So he's being clever here, saying, uh, basically you need to understand the language to get what we're talking about. That doesn't mean it's very mysterious, it's just unknown to you. So this is the real important part. He says, the brothers of the AA have set their faces against all charlatanism, whether miracle mongering or obscurantism. And all those persons who have sought reputation or wealth by such means may expect ruthless exposure, whether of their vanity or their dishonesty. For by no gentler means can they be taught. Uh, Crowley had a fun pastime. Uh, seances were a, a thing that happened a lot around this time, as you may well know. It was his favorite pastime to go to these and to ruth ruthlessly expose these people for the tricks that they were doing to make it seem like a seance was going on. Uh, there's actually something called the Psychical Society, Psychical Research Society, or something like that, that was very popular back then. Can you remember the name of it? Uh, Society for Psychical Research. There you go. Um, that they actually went around investigating these kinds of things, and Crowley was very much on their side. Uh, you might not expect that because he was himself such a huckster and such a, you know, an occultist. But no, he was very much against this kind of miracle mongering thing that uh, people start believing you because you can do these wacky things. No, that's not what we're about in the AA. Okay. So maybe the two society yeah. like research, they were, they were also interested in paranormal, paranormal phenomena, but were interested in approaching it in a scientific way, which is uh, like people like William James was a member of that. And so it makes a lot of sense for Crowley to sort of also um, 
running in that stream to be on board with that type of that type of project of going seances, debunking them if they if fraud is found to be the, the cause of whatever's going on. Yes, thank you. Um, I just recently, uh, I think today or yesterday, read an article about Bobotsky being investigated by this society, and they were not happy with what they found. I think Houdini had something kind of similar, but yeah. he was never telling anybody they were wrong. He just was like, prove it. Yeah, Houdini, like, Houdini yeah. was actually like really active in this kind of uh, challenging people because he knew all the tricks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, it's it's very much uh, the modern parallel. At least a few years ago, would be James Randi, who was a, actually a stage magician, uh, in in at least used to offer a million dollar prize for anyone that could, in scientific conditions, prove the existence of ESP or anything paranormal. Paranormal, uh, as you might expect, no one has ever claimed that prize. Uh, so the brothers of AA will advise simple experiments. This is. This is important. Science experiments, right? And and we'll describe them by the pens of their chosen delegates in the simplest available language. If you fail to obtain good results, blame either yourself or their method, as you will. If you succeed, thank either yourself or them, as you will. Which is to say, if the method works, the method works. Thank them for that method. It's nothing mysterious. The brothers of AA have set their faces against all charlatanism, miracle mongering, or obscuritism. Uh, same, same, same slide. Okay, good, good. Wow, done with reading. Okay, so the point is, is that the AA, this this organization that Crowley established, uh, was very. It was intended to be this kind of, in a way, theoretically ruthless way of approaching these phenomena. We want to know things that are verifiable, they're measurable. Uh, experiments should be done, and if you get results, you should thank the method, not you know, some spirits or something like that. So this may seem all very obvious to you, but it becomes clearer when you look at how virtually all other systems work. So how have virtually every system of attainment, meaning uh, spiritual enlightenment, and every system of cultism, how have they found what is true? Anyone have any guesses? Introspection. Hi. Introspection. That's that's true. I actually don't have that one up here. Experiments. Uh, I would say no. I would say that is not traditionally how a magician would figure out how to do something. Faith. Faith. Faith in what though? Whatever it is that's true. Yeah. <laughs> faith. Faith in whatever it is. There is the trip is. <laughs> Uh, so I'd say um, the primary well, that one of the primary ones is tradition, which is to say, if it's really old, it must be really true, or we've always done it that way. So that's the way it's done, and we do it that way because that's the way we've been doing it. Okay, so tradition. So anyone who ever has quoted scripture at you in any form, not just the Bible, anyone who has ever quoted scripture to justify something is relying on tradition. Uh, the classic is to root your ideas in an unknowable past tradition. Uh, the fad for a little bit was in India. Everything comes from India, right? The Mahatmas. Uh, Lubotsky was a fan of this one. Um, and then uh, there was an occult revival in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and then ancient Egypt became the place where everything came from. Uh, more recently, it's people got clever and they were like, oh wait, anthropologists can prove us wrong. We should definitely root it in something that they don't know about, like Atlantis or mm -hmm. Lemuria mm -hmm. uh, or Shandala. All these teachings de descend from Atlantis. They had the pure wisdom. How can you disprove that? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so tradition, at the very best, are just suggestions that we can take or leave. Well, what we have to guard against is this tendency to believe that the farther back we go, the more true it is. Uh, is it the fact that because child sacrifice was so widespread in the ancient world, it is the most, it is more spiritual and more correct than what we do now, which presumably is not sacrifice as many children? <laughs> I think. No. Uh, same with, uh, uh, people don't like mentioning that the Bible that, that the Bible uh, not only encourages it mandates a form many forms of slavery. Right? It's old. 
Does that mean it's true? Uh, I think most people, especially if you came to this lecture, would believe, no, that's not the case. So many things are very obviously false. The most classic one being that the Earth is at the center of the universe. That is simply not true. The fact that ancient peoples believed that just meant that they were ignorant. That's it. It doesn't mean, you know, that there's some secret wisdom there or something like that. The other one that's very much connected with tradition is authority. And by that I mean a specific person. So that one guy who often never actually existed said so, so it must be true. Uh, how many occultists quote Hermes Trismegistus as some kind of authoritative source on occultism? This person never existed. Or if he did, he was like 60 different people who were all amalgamated into this character. Uh, this goes also for Aleister Crowley. This also goes for me. So I would say that nowadays this is probably the most common, at least the one I encounter the most. Uh, Aleister Crowley said it, it must be true. Or, or uh, the, the favorite seems to be uh, Greek philosophers and Neoplatonists. Uh, if you could quote them saying something, it definitely is true. You know, Aristotle, if he said something, that guy was super wise. He must have been right. I mean, he was right about a lot of things, but that's not the point. <laughs> so, uh, in scientific illuminism, again, the best possible case is to listen to these important people, hear what they have to say, and then yourself determine if it is correct or not. I can assure you that neither Aristotle, nor Aleister Crowley, nor myself have ever been 100% uh, correct about everything. And the most annoying one is privileged or secret knowledge, which you're just too uninitiated to understand. It. You know, only I talk with the secret chiefs. Only I talk with uh, Kudhumi. Only I talk with Iwas or VVVVV or a lamb, this alien interdimensional creature that never existed. Um, so it's, the point of this is it's inaccessible. You can't disprove it. You can't claim they're wrong. And if, the more you claim they're wrong, the more they'll claim that you're just too stupid or ignorant or uninitiated to get it. What a bind. Um, so it's, it's still very much alive and well. Uh, the whole channeling thing is not so popular anymore, but there are definitely a lot of people that do that. Um, it's not as big as the 70s and the 80s, but it's still around. I would say these are probably the, the least useful knowledge claims out of all, the, all these three, at least. Uh, there's literally zero way to prove or disprove anything. Uh, and I think the, the onus of proof is on people who channel things. I've yet to hear uh, an ascended master say anything so pro profound and useful as E equals MC squared. Why is that? It's true every day. <laughs> Okay. It's true every day for everything. Other words. So, uh, more recently, there's something called scientism, which is using scraps of accepted scientific terminology and ideas in a disingenuous way to promote ideas that are not actually supported at all by science. For example, chakras as nerve plexuses, plexi. Um, this was actually very popular in the early 1900s to say that there are nerve ganglia in the body that are the chakras. I assure you, they are not there, or they are very, very loosely connected to the chakras. Believe it or not, there are millions of chakra systems, and they all put things in different places and attribute them in different ways. And so when people say this, they're not only collapsing a giant uh, multifaceted tradition into a singular edifice, uh, they also are conflating the fact that there are things kind of in that area with the fact that they are these chakra energy centers. They're not. Uh, there's also a movie that you all probably know called What the Bleep Do We Know? It is the best example of scientism ever. It is great as an example of that. Uh, there are truths mixed in with falsities uh, and you probably didn't know this, but it was created by Jay-Z Knight, who's better known as Ramtha, or the person who channels Ramtha. Uh, but you didn't know that someone channeled all that information that went into what the bleep do we know. Uh, it actually is literally this Ramtha uh, organization, dare I say. No, I won't say that because it might be sued. Okay. You can guess. 
Yeah. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, was that the, the double slit physicist guy or something like that? There's, there's a video online that everyone points to about uh, the double slit experiment. Uh, and if you take an intro to physics class, you will see that it's very strongly misrepresented. Yep. So. Uh, it's been a while since I read this book, but I think you like cited the logical fallacy like that this particular area would be attributed to. And I think you did that for a bunch of other things too. Is that that's possible? Okay. That was a lot smarter. I think smarter was, nine years yeah. ago. I think it's appeal appeal to authority. I think it was like oh oh, oh I see what you're saying. Yeah. Is the official fallacy. Okay. That would be referred to. Gotcha. Yeah. These are kind of split out to, to make it kind of simpler. Uh, so here's a hilarious example. Um, so this is using scientific appearance to give the appearance that this is empirically founded in some way, right? First of all, it's a diagram. Everyone knows that diagrams are true, right? Definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it looks like it's from a textbook. Newsweek. Yeah, or Newsweek, or, yeah, I wouldn't put much trust in that. Um, so this obviously is the God principle. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to, it might be a little hard to see, it's very small in here, I thought it'd be a little bigger. Uh, so 5% of frequencies of divine consciousness are transmitted outside the body, which I guess are these dotted lines. Uh, the seeker is able to access up to 20% of divine consciousness, uh, I guess through their fingers. Uh, protective sheath is their name for a shirt, it looks like. So your, your body is protected by a protective sheath. And 15% of the divine consciousness spreads into the body of the seeker, obviously. Uh, so, for those of you that walked in, I'm being highly sarcastic. Uh, uh, this is a perfect example of scientism. Using something like percentages that look like statistics, that look like science and math and stuff, and it's like, I don't know math, but that looks official, right? <laughs> That's kind of the effect it has. Where do they get 5, 20, and 15? Also, where are the rest of the 60% of the divine consciousness? Uh, they made this up, right? They just kind of guessed or whatever. You could say that you have a theory that partially this divine consciousness goes outside the body, some absorbed in the body, but they take it a step further with a diagram and percentages that are just completely made up. There's absolute, if you go to their website, there's zero study that has to do with this. And if, it, if they did have a study, it would be ridiculous, frankly. But yeah. I guess the ultimate example of this would be putting science in the name of your religion, mm -hmm. Christian science, or... Yeah, the, in, science. indeed. Yeah. Uh, there's one that, I can't remember the name of this, so I'll mention it later, because it's in my notes later, uh, but it has science in the title, and it's such a frequent thing to have scientific or, or some word that equates with that in your mind. But yeah, Christian science is as far from science as you can probably get. Do you remember where you found this? The Spiritual Science Society or something, I'll try to find it, it's later. This is awesome, I need more of this. <laughs> uh, here's another one. So, uh, obviously, yeah. destiny is 65% and willful action is 35%. <laughs> Did you know that 65% of our life is destined, i.e. not within our control? Yeah, duh. But if we use 35% willful action, uh, which by the way, yeah, willful action to do spiritual practice, we can reduce Negative destiny. <laughs> I'm not sure what negative destiny is, but it, it sounds really bad. It's our new, it's our new band name. Yeah. It's like, wow, you have scientized the idea of the future. And it's like negative destiny. Negative destiny is You get you get positive something. <laughs> it makes sense. So how is scientific Illuminism different from this? Different from tradition, different from authority, different from making crap up uh, and putting it on diagrams. So the method of science is essentially experimentation, just to cut it short. Crowley has uh, a story that I will give a short part of that is in 
number two of volume one of the Equinox. So if you open up the beginning of the second book, you will find this. This is an apocryphal story. It's 477 years since the trouble in the monastery. They were assembled many holy men from every part of the civilized world. Learned doctors, princes of the church, bishops, abbots, deans, all the wisdom of the world. For the question was important. How many teeth are there in a horse's mouth? For many days the debate swung this way and that. Father was quoted against father, gospel against epistle, psalm against proverb, and the summer being hot and the shade of the monastery gardens pleasant, a young monk wearied of the discussion. And rising presumptuously among those revered men, impudently proposed that they should examine the mouth of a horse and settle the question. Now there was no precedent for so bold a method, and we are not to be surprised that those holy men arose right wrathfully and fell upon that youth and beat him sore. <laughs> okay, so the question is, how many teeth does a horse have? And of course, everyone goes to authority and tradition. The psalm, I mean, obviously, these things don't actually have different ideas as to the number of teeth in a horse's mouth, but you go to the gospel, the epistle, the psalm, and the proverb, and then someone was audacious enough to say, what if we just looked? What if we performed an experiment? What if we took data and drew a conclusion from that? Uh, and so he got beat up. <clears throat> That is a parable of the beginning of empiricism. Uh, and often uh, Francis Bacon is the person credited with, with creating this kind of approach. Obviously many people have done it before him, uh, but that was kind of the symbolic start of it. So how is scientific illuminism different? Scientific illuminism is a system of spiritual science where the method is science and the aim is religion or illuminism. Now, the primary subject matter of scientific illuminism is the self, the individual. We are not studying horses' mouths uh, or anything like that. What we're doing is working on ourselves. Remember, I said those, this whole project is an extension of the project to know thyself, this ancient uh, spiritual pursuit of self-knowledge. So our method is science, our subject of inquiry is ourselves or the individual. And now we come to this idea of the aim of religion, which he often equates with Illuminism and scientific Illuminism. Uh, one way to think about this, and this is not strictly Crowley, this is kind of an elaboration of Crowley and his idea of poema. The purpose, the aim of religion is to fulfill the potential of the individual. And this is twofold, which is to say the potential of the individual is fulfilled in two aspects. The infinite and the finite will, which, most, which must both be accomplished if the will is to be accomplished. For those of you uh, less familiar with Thalema, there is one purpose in the law of Thalema, which is to find and do your true will, which is to say to understand your nature and to fulfill that nature. That's it. So everything is geared toward that. Crowley conveniently splits this into infinite and finite will. Uh, this this split comes from Crowley, and it, for those of you who care, which are probably not many, it comes from Delege Labellum. So the infinite will is this idea that each individual, each one of you, are all called to the great work, which is to say the identification with one's own godhead. The phrase identification with one's own Godhead is one phrase among many. Uh, union with God, union with the Absolute, uh, Nirvana, Samadhi, Kensho, all these kinds of things that all point to the same experience of a unitary, uh, a unitary experience of the universe, which is to say, experiencing the universe as a single phenomenon. Many people call that phenomenon God. Right? Godhead he is here defined as a state of non-duality or infinity. Non-duality is a negative expression, which is to say it's not duality. Infinity is positive, which is to say it is an infinite. These are just words to point at that same thing. Godhead, infinity, the absolute, the one, the none, etc. We might call this the actualization of our spiritual potential. And our theory and practice for attaining that 
Crowley would class under mysticism. Sometimes he calls it yoga. Okay, infinite will, this, this kind of perennial project of attaining union with God, or whatever you want to call it, and we call that, uh, Crowley often called that mysticism. Now, the finite will is kind of the, the hard part, <laughs> if that's not hard enough, which is to say, each one of you has your finite will, which is unique to you. Each individual is uniquely called to their own particular way, which is your purpose on earth. Uh, most people think of this in terms of their career, although that's simply a metaphor. One of us might be a psychologist, another, as Crowley said, might be a jade worker or a steel worker. Um, some people, uh, I mean, each, each person does their own thing on earth. And this is the aspect of Philema that most people are very familiar with. Each person has their own way in life. It's your job to find out what that is and to do it. So we might call this the actualization of the individual's psychophysical potential or their material potential. And the theory and practice of this, Crowley often calls magic. Mysticism for the infinite, magic for the finite. These are not necessarily always the case, but it is a convenient designation. I just want to know, what, what's the difference between the infinite and the finite? Um, what's the difference between them? I don't think there is, so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you could clarify what the difference is. Yeah, so, so there's this idea. The point is, is that each person, the whole purpose is to do your true will. Um, this is often talked about in simply the way of finite will. So people often equate true will with basically figuring out what you're supposed to do in life. Uh, it's it's really trite nowadays, you know, be yourself, become who you are, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's, that's the line, that's what you're trying to do. The finite thing is what differentiates you from every other finite being. The infinite will is something that Crowley just equates with the mystical goal of experientially attaining to a, a sense of unity. Okay, uh, this is... It's called so many names that uh, I try to list some every time I talk about it to show that it is basically the same goal behind all at least esoteric traditions. Uh, but generally people know it as union with God. Now, the point is, is that you can be a super mystic and totally be at one with God and still not necessarily know your particular place in this world, a particular thing that you are to do. You may get some insight <laughs> through that experience, uh, but they are not exactly the same. And similarly, you could totally own your place in life and be super awesome at what you do and your unique contribution to the world and have never attained this kind of infinite will or this, this experience of the infinite. Uh, I believe that Crowley, he talks about this in various ways, but the, the idea is that to do your true will most completely or most fully, both of these aspects need to be accessed or uh, worked on at the very least. Um, very stereotypically, you might might call the infinite will the, the general project of Eastern religions, uh, whereas the finite will is very much what we're told to do in Western civilization. You know, find your place in this world and, and do your job, right? It's a very common idea. Does that at all clarify anything? I see what you're saying. <laughs> it, it's simply a theoretical model to try to explain things. Uh, the, the point being that the method of religion, or the aim of religion, is to accomplish your true will. And then I'm trying to very briefly expand that idea into a finite and infinite. So the method of science is one of experimentation, the basis of which is the making of observations to confirm or refute hypotheses. So this implies a kind of tentative non-acceptance of all theories, success is their proof. Okay, so tentative means that you only accept things for now, until something better comes along. So. An example from the field of mysticism. Uh, most mystic systems 
inculcate uh, sexual chastity. Right? You should not engage in any kind of sexual relation if you're into yoga or you know, if you want to join the, the Buddhist monastery. You have to give it up. Uh, that is a... It's not necessarily true that sexual chastity is a moral quality that is beneficial to increasing concentration in meditation. It is very much encouraged by Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Islamic, etc. forms of mysticism. Uh, but one might, for example, be married, and it might cause more distraction to not have sex than to have sex. Okay, so all of you look at me like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> um, so there's a thing we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to concentrate. In, for, for this example, in mysticism or in yoga, we want to concentrate. This is our experiment. How can we concentrate best? Well, our hypothesis is that sexual chastity helps concentration. Now we have to make observations to confirm or refute that hypothesis, which is to say we do not simply accept that. Patanjali said sexual chastity is required for concentration. We say, that's nice, we'll try it out. We'll use that as a hypothesis and we will try it out to see the data. It's not necessarily true. We have to experiment with it. The point being that, just as one example, if you are in a relationship, refraining from sex might actually cause more difficulty with concentration and more distraction than just having sex. This is just one example. Yeah. I would point out that Hinduism is kind of awesome because they have lots of different paths, and one path is tantric sex, which is sure. accomplishing hopefully similar things to the you know, the uh, chast or chaste priests or whatever. All right. Yeah. Yeah. There is a small sect of of Amacharya said that, that do indeed engage in sexual contact. Um, the, that reinforces that there are many different ways to accomplish the same goal. The point is, is that there are these things that we simply take to be true because people say it. We will take them to be true when they are demonstrated in our own experience. Which is mm -hmm. to say, their proof is in their success. We can accept that sexual chastity uh, increases concentration in a tentative way in, insofar as we are just trying it out. It's only when we confirm or refute those hy that hypothesis that we actually say, you know what, that doesn't work so well, so well for me. Or, you know what, that's actually true. It does work for me. Uh, yeah? I, I, I don't know how relevant this is, but there's also like the fact that Crowley kind of like redefines chastity in the Ways too when he uses mm -hmm. the term, which is an interesting thing to, to notice if, if he's coming from a scientific background uh, to one degree or another, um, and then, uh, you know, still continuing to use some of the terminology which comes from tradition, but it has to take on sort of a, a new quality or a new dimension uh, once, you know, a lot of the uh, sort of old ways of, of thinking about these things. Uh, turn out to not actually be sound. Or right. Yeah, so, I mean, one one way to, to go is to be like, chastity, that's bullshit. Goodbye, like, forever. Another way is to say, actually, it was just interpreted the wrong way. And the real way to do this is, you know, X or Y. Uh, I won't go into Crowley's kind of elaborate way of, of explaining chastity. Uh, but that is certainly another way to do it. Science is full of examples of things that actually turn out to be other things later. Or they turn out to be the same thing, like the whole electricity and magnetism. I don't know if you know this, but they are actually part of the same phenomenon. We, yeah. Yeah, you guys. <laughs> Have you guys heard of 19th century science? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, so, like, another example might be from ceremonial magic. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of the LBRP or the Kabbalistic Cross? Anyone? Uh, so this this refers to uh, the Kabbalistic Cross is a ritual of intentional movements and words that accomplish some supposed end. So it sounds like this. Atah, Malkuth, Vigabora, Vigadula, Le'olam, Amen. 
Nice ritual, right? <laughs> um, so some people say ata and then put iwas right here. Ata iwas, malkut, vigaboro, vigadua, leolam, amen. Crowley actually encouraged this to his students, at least through oral tradi tradition. We know that he encouraged this. Uh, why would, uh, should we simply accept that Iwas at the chest level makes the Kabbalistic cross super awesome and better? No. Why would, why would that work better than say, Yao, or, you know, or your own holy guardian, holy guardian angel? Or, you know, like saying Ata Benedict Cumberbatch or something like that. <laughs> it's like, why, why would one thing work better than another? What's that? You do something long enough, it, it creates an imprint. That's so it. <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you don't even have to think about it anymore. It's well, just gotten an imprint. So like it works that way. But I, I, yeah, I don't agree with that either. I think you should be yeah. able to make your own stuff. Right. So, so, you're, so you're saying the power is in the imprint. Uh, and I very much... Could be. Or could be. Could yeah, be. I very much agree with that as a possibility. The point is, is that you would be, you should try out, you know, Ata Benedict Cumberbatch, and then, you know, and be like, oh yeah, that, that kind of doesn't work. It kind of kicks me out of it a little bit. <laughs> you can't pronounce penguins, it's very distracting. Uh, so the point is, is that both in mysticism, in concentrating, as well as ceremonial magic, as well as pretty much any spiritual practice, you take the same kind of approach, which is to say, you know, that's nice, Crowley, that's nice, whoever. Uh, let me try that out for myself and see how it works. So, scientific illuminism, in short, is the theory and practice of the individual's achievement of the aim of religion through the method of science. Our data of our experiments are the experiences of the individual. So, the tool of observation is consciousness or awareness. One could say that the accuracy of our observations is based on the accuracy of the instrument used to make observations. So if you use a microscope uh, and you don't focus it, you won't see much, right? Or if the lens is broken or, or anything like that. In this case, your own awareness is that tool. So just as a microscope has to be cleaned, calibrated, and so on, so do the tools of this inquiry, which is to say that the best mind, the best consciousness, is one that is cleared of certain detrimental qualities to the accurate perception of experiences. In the language of ceremonial magic, the weapons of the magician must be purified and consecrated before their use is devoted to a certain purpose. So the most powerful tool of observation, which is to say the most useful consciousness, is one where its faculties are fully functional. Okay, so just to give an example, the mind, uh, imagine if you couldn't remember anything, or if you had a really hard time remembering things after about 10 seconds, you know, like if you had dementia or something. It would be very hard to do anything resembling an experiment and record your results if you can't even remember what happened. Now, most of you probably know that memory is not very good anyway for those of us who lack dementia, you know, just our normal people with uh, normal brains. Um, memory is very fluid and you can actually train the faculty of memory to get better. So in this case, as memory is one example of a, a quality of consciousness, quality of the mind, it can be trained to be more powerful. If our mind is our instrument of observation, we want it to be as clear and powerful as possible. So we want our memory to be powerful. We want our concentration uh, and our visualization, all sorts of things. Which is to say, um, you can't just go out and buy the tool of scientific illuminism. You have to work for it. You have to become the tool that engages in these experiments. Because there is no other way to obtain the data of experience except through your first person experience. That's kind of tautological, but roll with it. 
Uh, so one thing you'll notice is that this, this approach is basically like pragmatism, which is to say uh, things are true if they work. There's no absolute sense of their truth. Uh, and you're saying, how is that possible? Let's look at an example. Does anyone know what that means? F equals ma. Force equals mass times acceleration. Yes. So uh, this is a um, oh, chemistry. What's that field called? Physics. Physics. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Brain fart. Obviously, my consciousness is not very well honed. Um, so force equals mass times acceleration. This is a Newtonian formula. Right, so Newton had these laws. Force equals mass times acceleration. Is this true? Anyone? Relatively. It's true enough. True enough. That's exactly right. It's relatively or true enough. Which is to say, uh, this was actually thought to be completely true for everything for a while. And then it found, we found out that it actually it's only true within a certain limit for macroscopic objects like your body, like cannonballs, that kind of thing. When you get down to the level of molecules, let alone uh, atoms or subatomic things, this does not hold true at all. There's completely other formulas that are way more complicated uh, and way more fun than F equals MA. But if I were to use this to, say, um, cal calculate the uh, the force of a flying object like a cannonball, would it be accurate? Yes, it would. And it's useful for doing that. So it is true for our purposes. It's useful, so it's true. Curly says, our canon of truth is maximum convenience. Mm -hmm. Also known as Mr. 666. Um, this is when he's actually talking about spirits and astral entities. And he's saying, you can conceive of them as either real things that are separate from yourself or as part of yourself. But it's often more convenient to speak of them as if they existed separate from yourself, like angels and spirits. So they are, because it's convenient to speak of them like that. That is true, because it's useful to speak that way. Not because they actually are, or because F equals MA is an actual truth written into the universe at the Big Bang. It's not. It's simply a tentative way of uh, manipulating the world or understanding the world that is true within a convenient limit. Does that sort of make sense, at least? I see a few people nodding, so that's, that's I'll take it. Um, there is the clearest example of this in Crowley's writings comes from a chapter in a text called Liber O that I think is the most important paragraph written about magic in the last few hundred years. So in Liber O, let me step back for a second. Liber O is the introduction to ceremonial magic and ritual. It introduces the lesser ritual of the pentagram, the Kabbalistic cross, it introduces astral projection, or we might call it that nowadays. Um, it introduces Kabbalistic correspondences and that kind of thing. And this is right at the beginning. So he's saying, in this book, Libre O, it's spoken of the Sephirot and the paths, spirits and conjurations, gods, spheres, planes, and many other things which may or may not exist. It is immaterial whether these things exist or not. By doing certain things, certain results follow. Students are most earnestly warned against attributing objective reality or philosophic validity to any of them. Okay. So we might operate as if these things are real within the moment. Uh, we might do things that reference these ideas. But in the end, it's the doing of certain things that result in other things that matters, which is kind of a fancy way to say... Uh, Basically, if you do the cause, you'll get the expected effect. It doesn't have to do with these metaphysical ideas of spheres, planes, spirits, etc. floating out there. It doesn't even matter if they exist. If you do the thing and you get the result, it's successful. If you do the thing. By their fruits you shall know them. Uh, by their fruits you shall know them is basically the biblical version of this. 
you will know them by what results follow from them. Uh, so, okay. So in another definition, scientific illuminism represents the effort to undertake the tasks of mysticism and magic using the method of science. So hypotheses such as uh, sitting in full lotus is the best posture for meditation um, or, you know, the whole magical idea of this divine name here works best or something like that. These are all hypotheses that should be tested by observing in your own experience, which is to say by testing them out in your own experience. Okay. So if you think that Benedict Cumberbatch might work really well at the, the breast level during a Kabbalistic cross, you wouldn't simply make that claim, or even you know quote Aleister Crowley as a traditional authority if you could find him referencing something like that. You would do it a lot and record your own observations, your own experience, and you would determine if it works or not, if it has the intended result or not. So... If we articulate a hypothesis, such as full lotus is the best position for meditation, uh, and we're recording data, we need to record that data in something, theoretically. So the articulation of a hypothesis, which is to say making a hypothesis, making a, some kind of statement about how things work, and recording data from observations, it requires a record. Uh, in magic, we call this the magical record. Because it's magic. It's a magical record, I guess. Mm -hmm. So Crowley in Lieber E, uh, if you want to know about scientific illuminism, there is a there is a short text called Lieber E, and there's a short text called Lieber O. Lieber E is your introduction to mysticism. Lieber O is your introduction to magic. It's that simple. So, um, it really isn't that simple. Uh, so, um, in Lieber E, he talks about this idea of the record. He says, it's absolutely necessary that all experiments should be recorded in detail during or immediately after their performance. Notice he calls them experiments. That's not my language, that's his. So the magical record allows the experimenter to collect and organize data. and allows uh, for the retrieval of that data without relying on a further date on your totally faulty faculty of memory. Believe me, it does not work very well. Um, Anyone who's, who here has ever tried to have a dream journal or something like that, tried to record your dreams, uh, what happens if you wait a few minutes to write it down? It's gone. it's gone, right? Let alone a few months. Can you imagine trying to remember a dream from a few months ago without having written it down? There's Believe me. I uh, unless it's those really uh, intense ones, but yeah. The point is all the data, not just the, the ones that stick out really. Really well. So it allows the practitioner to collect, organize, review, and retrieve data from experience. Uh, it's often called the lab book of our spiritual praxis, our spiritual practices. So if we're a scientist, this is our lab book, the magical record. The reliance on tradition, authority, hearsay, anecdote, opinion, they are excluded from consideration in terms of the validity of the hypothesis. No one cares, really, if William James and Patanjali and Crowley all say something, if it's wrong for you. Uh, if they all say the full lotus is the best position, then you get into a full lotus, and it cuts off the circulation to your entire body. What does that tell you about full lotus for you? Uh, either it's not for you, or you, you ain't there yet, right? So it does not matter, really. What these people say, what matters is your experience, experience and your experiments. Let's see what else we got here. So Crowley says, this is again Lieber E, we insist here upon the vital importance of the written record as the only possible check upon error derived from the various qualities of the experimenter. Uh, I think Crowley was aware that you'll see the world in your own image if, that, if it's left to you. The way to guard against this is to record data. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That means the written record that goes to your teacher, yeah. who then checks it. So Indeed. You can 
very easily move your right finger over the lower your right eye. Indeed, you can. Uh, many scientists do that as well. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good point. So, yes, it, it is within the context of this specific system. However, it is a definite check upon error, a potential check. Um, Crowley writes, he must rely entirely upon himself and credit nothing whatever but that which, which lies within his own knowledge and experience. That's a really radical view for occultism and, and religion and spirituality in general. Uh, it may have influenced or, or uh, infiltrated our culture so much that you're sitting there being like, yeah, how else would, would you even do that? Uh, but this is a really different way to approach these things. Did Crowley himself uh, employ like, peer review? Like, would he show people his magical record and try to see if he was polluting himself? Or... Uh, peer review would be limited to your superior. Uh, superior being someone who theoretically has already done these experiments for themselves and has their own experience to draw on. Uh, but um, I know of at least one case where it went to a superior and then went to Crowley himself, so there's two people, but uh, he did not establish you know, a parliament of uh, double-blind studies and peer review. He, he, it definitely would not stand up to uh, like a publication in Nature or Science or something like that. Uh, but he nonetheless very much took the, the essence of that approach and wanted to apply it, that of experimentation and checking your results, rather than just being like, well, I follow tradition, so it must be right, right? Right? Uh, so, each experiment has to be reported in detail, with clarity, conciseness, Consider, uh, so this example, I, I wrote this and then I realized after attending the class here that it actually comes from eight lectures on yoga, the example. Uh, but consider the difference between these two statements, okay? On the one hand, we have, um, I prayed fervently to the Lord, to the Lord for the space of a few days. So I prayed fervently to the Lord for a space of a few days. Imagine that written in a magical record versus... I, I visualized a yellow square for 23 minutes, which approxi with approximately five breaks of attention, lasting mo no more than about 10 seconds. Now, what's different between these two? In the first instance, we have no idea I fervently prayed to the Lord, right? We have no idea what fervently meant. We have no idea what prayer even means. We have no idea who the Lord is in this person's mind. And for the space of a few days, who knows how long this lasted and who knows what other grocery store trips they went in the meantime, or whatever. It's completely inaccurate. It, so it's completely unclear. The point being that you need to be accurate and specific with what you are recording. Simply writing something down does not make it science, uh, contrary to what Mythbuster says. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. So naturalistic occultism. So scientific illuminism, as Crowley explained it, is pretty much anti-metaphysical, which is to say it, it is against any kind of metaphysic, whether supernaturalism or naturalism or anything else, idealism or whatever. Uh, there's actually a part in the Book of Lies where, explain this hap some person says, explain this happening. One person says, it must have a natural cause. The other person says, it must have a supernatural cause. And he says, of course, let these two asses be set to grind corn. Uh, which is, uh, I believe, is a nice way to say they both are full of shit. They don't know what they're talking about, or let them do something useful instead of talking <laughs> about this kind of crap. So that's pure kind of scientific illuminism. I would say that naturalistic occultism is kind of a, a step up or a step to the side of scientific illuminism. So naturalistic occultism is the attempt to understand occultism and magic in general without positing anything supernatural, without positing anything found outside the mainstream social and natural sciences, especially psychology and neurology. So the attempt to cut away superstitious beliefs from occultism which I believe was the project of scientific illuminism. Uh, 
Uh, so we do this with a very critical and pragmatic eye. The kinds of questions that a naturalistic occultist would ask is, can the astral plane be understood in terms of contemporary science? How can the effects of ritual be explained physiologically or psychologically? Is there a psychological reason why people think that divination and horoscopes work? The answer is yes. Uh, so these are the kinds of questions that a naturalistic occultist asks. There is an immense amount of fantasy, swindling, and charlatanism in the field of, of the occult. <clears throat> this approach of naturalistic occultism is meant to encourage the scientific pursuit of ceremonial ritual and occultism in general. And in separating the goal from the draws, so we question our assumptions about occultism, and I think a lot have to be altered or discarded. The main point is that we do not try to explain mystery with mystery, which is to say we do not try to explain the mysterious world or the mysterious results of our meditation and our magic with more mysterious things. Uh, well, this mysterious experience is obviously because of these mysterious energies, chakras, planes, spheres, rays, planets, and trigrams. Uh, it's basically substituting one thing that we don't know for another thing that we don't know. At the, at the very best, they are useful metaphors for what's going on. So the point is, naturalistic occultism attempts to ground occultism in modern science and discard as many unnecessary assumptions as possible. In a sentence, it's a paradigm that approaches the occult with scientific knowledge, skeptical rigor, and prag in a pragmatic attitude. So, it's unfortunate that occultism is plagued by ins incessant superstition, in my opinion. This largely could have to do with the large overlap of occultism with the New Age community. I'm sorry if you uh, identify with that, uh, for your sake. Um, <laughs> it is notorious for pseudoscience in all forms. We naturalistic occultists, which I consider myself one, you may yourself as well, we frown upon making vague and ambiguous claims, like astral currents did it. Oh, it's your subtle energies. Um, you hit me right in the chakras. <laughs> <laughs> so a scientific approach to magic means the theories, the conduct, and the results are all explained with a scientific attitude. An empirical attitude, one where we directly observe these things and we try to fit these into a scientific world. Uh, to begin this scientific approach, we have to see there's something really fundamental that neurology accepts, strict neurology, but many people don't even realize. So our perception of the world, your perception of the world, and of yourselves, your entire consciousness is essentially a product of the workings of that marvel of nature known as the human nervous system. Specifically, the human body has, has adapted to receive external stimuli and interpret that information, creating a representation in awareness. For example, vibrations of electromagnetic energy from, say, the screen hit your eye, your rods and your cones are activated, they turn in that stimulus into an electrical signal that travels through your optical nerve to your visual cortex, some, re some relay points in your brain, etc., etc. Only at that point do you become aware of a sight. Right? Your neurology is a prerequisite for that experience. So the entire world of which you are aware, your mind, your body, and the, the environment, is a product of the intricate and complex workings of the human nervous system interpreting the world. Changes in the nervous system will be accompanied by changes in perception, and vice versa. There's, it's not possible. How, how otherwise? How would you have a change in perception unless there was some kind of physiological change in your body that created that perception? Uh, this was so such a crazy idea recently that Francis Crick, anyone know that guy? He helped discover DNA. Uh, he called this the astonishing hypothesis. He said, um, he said that you, the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity, your free will, are in fact no more than the vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. I think this is one basic fact you can take to when you begin to integrate and keep in mind a scientific understanding of occult phenomena. 
we can start to redefine things within magic. For example, magic itself might be understood as the volitional control of the human nervous system through the manipulation of itself, the rest of the body and its environment. Uh, the study and application of magical correspondences or Kabbalistic correspondences can be an, understood as intern, internal conditioning. Um, crap, I forgot to plug this in. Yay. Uh, so these correspondences might be understood as intentional conditioning of associations between various things. Sensory, sensory stimuli like sights, sounds, uh, smells, and tastes with abstract or moral ideas. Uh, so um, correspondences might be understood simply as this pairing or priming like we were just talking about in the nervous system. If you pair two things enough together, they become bonded. This, the classic example is Pavlov's dogs, who uh, every time the bell is rung before food was put out, and then eventually, they, the dog started salivating just at the ringing of the bell. They were paired so many times that they became equated. Bell means food, which means I'm hungry, right? This is the one way to understand magical correspondences, such as uh, the correspondences between tarot cards and Hebrew letters, zodiac signs, the elements, that kind of thing. You can understand them as the intentional uh, coupling of stimuli. Initiating, initiation itself might be understood as the deconditioning of the nervous system and the reconditioning in accordance with the volition of that organism. Uh, the point is, is that when you start to accept these ideas, the frame of magic starts to shift and you start to understand what's going on in a different way. If you want to know more, there are soon this book. <laughs> so I'd say that there are kind of two types of people that are averse to what I'm talking about, averse to this model of magic. And I, I don't mean to be insulting, but I will just for entertainment's sake. Okay? So those who are averse to naturalistic approach to magic, there is the charlatan who fears and hates science. And there is secondly, the pseudoscientist who disingenuously makes use of rigorous and systematic sound of, of scientific language to make his or her fraud appear scientific and therefore legitimate. So people who hate science and people who use science wrong. Okay? So the first type includes all those people who always, I mean, if you, if you take this approach, you will encounter this argument. Uh, you are materializing everything. You're reducing everything. You're psychologizing everything. You're making it mundane. So this, this type, I think, finds some kind of strange satisfaction in explaining the mysteries of the world with more mystery, more strange and ambiguous words and ideas, perhaps out of a misunderstanding that science says everything they believe is total illusion. That's not what science says. Uh, this, this kind of person often retreats into obscure and, and the obscure and the supernatural to explain their beliefs, and many uh, think that this gives a kind of magical feel to their life. Science gets rid of the magic in my life. No, it gets rid of the illusion in my life. I'm sorry. Uh, so, I would say that it is a depreciation of the natural and of the human to think that explaining occult phenomena in terms of the psyche is somehow a reduction. What that says is you don't have a very high opinion of the human psyche. We can probably all agree that occultism should be a tool to expand and, and uh, enhance your awareness so as to more effectively appreciate, embrace, and integrate into reality, which is to say, not as a tool to escape from reality, but to engage with it. <clears throat> so in contrast to this first type of fear, naturalist occult occultism tries to show that nature itself, especially the human consciousness and the human psychophysiology, is fucking crazy. It's mysterious. It's magical. All the extraordinary visions, all the crazy feelings and states of mind that you experience in your uh, meditational practices, in your magical practices, on your psychedelic trips, all that stuff is in you. So instead of being a psychologization of magic, it's an infusing of the psyche with magic. 
a scientific understanding of occult phenomena as belonging to the human psychophysiology does not diminish their beauty, does not diminish their interest uh, or their knowledge-giving quality, or even their mystery. In fact, we acknowledge the human psyche as, as beautiful, interesting, and full of wisdom, and ultimately mysterious. Uh, someone named Lon Milo Duquette once said, it's all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is. Uh, so he gets away with his idea because he's a lot cleverer in talking about it. And it's a very catchy phrase. Um, I would say that the claim that science is reducing or limiting all these things is a very limiting view of science itself. Science, here's, here's a, a sentence, science is only limiting in the same sense that sanity limits what we take as reality. Must be pretty useful then. So in the second type are people that peddle pseudoscience, who use the language of science to present their superstitious claims as legitimate. Uh, so how many, uh, it's really common, how many people have heard of various machines that show you your aura? They do not. Uh, how many people have heard of explanations why homeopathy supposedly works? I'm sorry for all of you that use homeopathy. It is zero basis in any kind of empirical study. There is no basis in reality. How about correlations between chakras and nerve ganglia, like I mentioned before? There is zero basis for this belief. It sounds good. It feels good. There is no experimental proof for any of these things. Should we say that that limits the world? Or is that limiting, limiting in the same sense that sanity limits what we take as reality? Yeah. So couldn't you say, like, with homeopathy, that it works and is real in the sense that if someone believes in it, it could enable their placebo effect to help them in some way? And, but that's, that's just saying the placebo effect that's, that's, that's kind of using something mysterious to explain something mysterious again. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't really understand the placebo fully. The placebo effect is real. But it's not magical, right? right? I mean, it's it's not homeopathy. It's right. a placebo effect. It, a placebo implies there's nothing actually working in a direct fashion. Uh, so the point is, is that there are plenty of people who use sciencey things that are just false. Okay, here it is. It's called the Spiritual Science Research Foundation. <laughs> The point is, is, look at that. It has science and research and foundation in it. That's like a triple threat. They're, they're totally solid and empirical, right? They have diagrams, and you see that's a pie chart? It's like a three-dimensional pie chart. <laughs> they like had to click an extra button on Excel to get that. So from, from their name, you would think that they conduct scientific research, but you would be wrong. Okay, so if you look at their actual material, you'll see diagrams, graphs, tables of data about the effectiveness of various positions of prayer. There are actually different diagrams where they like put their hands in different places, uh, and you know they give different percentages of how much the divine consciousness goes into your body. Um, they'll have numbers like five or thirty percent to show the, the effectiveness. What are these numbers based on? Uh, the short answer is nothing. It is an intuitive introspection, and someone goes, yeah, that's about 20%. <laughs> it's just like, how do people accept this kind of thing? So, so calling your own kind of intuitive introspection science does not make it science. Putting numbers in a table does not make it empirically verified. Unfortunately, there are always those who will see the name of an organization and uh, its charts and its graphs and end up thinking they're scientifically investigating spirituality. They ain't. On the contrary, they are simply reaffirming and solidifying their own superstitions and pre-held beliefs through scientism. It's a com it's, they either do not know what scientific research means, or they are deliberately attempting to manipulate you. Is that false to say? They either don't get it, or they know, and they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Which one is it? Neither of those sound very good to me. So I would say we agree with Dion Fortune. Anyone know her? Yeah. Woo! Uh, so Dion Fortune was an occultist from uh, contemporary Crowley's. She wrote that all available occult phenomena should be carefully investigated. 
not only for the sake of obtaining knowledge, but also for the sake of unmasking charlatans. People used to be uh, really con confrontational in the occult world, it seems. Glad that hasn't stopped, or glad that stopped. That, that's sarcastic, if you've ever been on Facebook. Um, yeah, so basically what we are trying to do is to wed science and religion. This is a very old, common thing. How do science and religion relate, or do they not? This is part of that same, that same goal. Um, so, so naturalistic occultism points toward a new type of occultist, in my view, who does not fear science, but instead acknowledges and wields its power and its knowledge. So, naturalistic occultists, we view nature and the human psyche as alive and mysterious, not as dead screens that things are projected onto. Scientific knowledge informs our experience, and our experience improves scientific knowledge. We acknowledge the subjective reality of the occult and mystical phenomena without overstepping their bounds and imputing objective reality seen to them. We do not impute uh, philosophical validity or objective reality, as it says in Libra O. And we embrace both the experiential beauty of occultism possibilities and the cognitive or intellectual beauty of, system, of science's systematic approach to understanding phenomena and explaining them. I'd say these are kind of four broad qualities that would distinguish this approach from others to occultism. Believe me, there are people out here who are very, very strongly opposed to this, like violently so militantly so this is a new idea and a one that I think is writing the zeitgeist of where we are going in my opinion uh, but I'm the one up here talking so of course I would say that Crowley in his Equinox um, volume one number two so the second book in the Equinox he has this cool thing explaining scientific illuminists and I'll read it to you number one we are mystics we are ever eagerly seeking a solution of unpleasant facts Unpleasant facts, he refers to uh, the inherent sorrow of the world. So mystics are seeking a solution to that. Number two, we are men of science, ever e eagerly acquiring pertinent facts. We are skeptics, ever eagerly examining those facts. We are philosophers, ever eagerly classifying and coordinating those well-criticized facts. We are Epicureans, ever eagerly enjoying the unification of those facts. We are philanthropists, ever eagerly transmitting our knowledge of those facts to others. Further, we are secretists, taking truth from all systems, ancient and modern, and eclectics, ruthless, ruthlessly discarding the inessential factors in any one system, however perfect. As in all things, in science, there is no absolute conclusion, only an inconclusive conclusion. It has to be tentative and provisional, like all scientific knowledge. I think that naturalistic occultists are in a privileged position in the field of occultism. We are at the edge, which is to say we walk the line between science and religion, with both supporting us. We neither discard science for superstitious religion, that is disparaging of science, nor do we discard religion for a reductionistic, reductionistic view of science that is disparaging of religion. We approach these religious occult phenomena with a scientific eye, and see them naturally. We do not uncritically ac accept these supernatural forces and entities. We do not neglect the power of the practices themselves, but do not need these supernatural explanations. It's at this razor's edge where I think we're at an advantage to investigate phenomena that are difficult to explain psychologically and physiologically. Now this field is largely represented by what most people know as parapsychology, with studies of things like ESP, extrasensory perception, uh, remote viewing, telekinesis, all those fun things that no one has ever proven. Uh, these kinds of things defy our current understanding of the world. For them to be true, we must be wrong about the way the world works. Now, if you are truly a scientist, you should accept that we could be wrong. 
Not that we are wrong and that ESP must be true, but that it is possible. Our model is incomplete. So there are obviously a ton of charlatans who try to move things with their, or pretend to move things with their minds, but they're doing some kind of sleight of hand. Uh, there's one trick where you move a pencil and it's actually a uh, breath that's moving the pencil along the table. Some of you may have seen that. Uh, anyone who knows Uri Geller? Anyone? Ever heard of him? Uh, so he was famous for really bending spoons until someone showed that it's quite easy to fake that and it's a common magician's trick. So there are plenty of charlatans, there are plenty of psychics who make thousands of predictions uh, and, you know, they get that one hit and they're genius, they're psychic, they must be a psychic. Uh, but those 999 other ones that were completely false, of course, you know, whatever, forget about those, right? That should not discourage us from the possibility of exploring the truth or falsity of these propositions in, in the belief in psychic people, at least in telekinesis or anything. Uh, we should be, this is the, science, the true scientific attitude. You should be skeptical, but not close-minded. You should work off the evidence that you have and not preclude the possibility of new data overturning our current ideas, our current hypotheses about how things work.